Over the last 10 years, India's economic boom has changed the nation's landscape. This once agrarian society is now a major global IT and manufacturing competitor. Some 270 special economic zones, or SEZs, have been approved to attract trade and foreign investment. But SEZs have also been blamed of robbing rural communities of land and their livelihoods. I'm Fauzia Ibrahim. In this edition of 101 East, we ask, are India's SEZs a boon or a bust? Much of the controversy over India's SEZ relates to land acquisition. Here in Raigad, two hours out of Mumbai city, residents are fighting development plans for what's being billed as Asia's largest SEZ. Farmers are reluctant to give up their land despite being offered compensation. Chan Chao Cho reports on what some have dubbed India's special exploitation zones. <laughs> On the outskirts of Mumbai, this song strikes a chord with the rural dwellers in Raigat district. The name of the song, Reliance, has come to loot you. Reliance Industries is a name that strikes fear and anger among many people here. The conglomerate is India's largest private sector company. The Indian government has approved Reliance's plan to build India's biggest special economic zone, or SEZ, here. When that happens, thousands of hectares of farmland will make way, and with it, the livelihoods of many people from 45 villages. Already, the impact has been felt. I received the land acquisition notice two years ago, but I refused to give up my land. A group of us even went on a hunger strike last year in protest. Janadan Mukun Matre is angry at how the SEZ plans put a halt to the completion of this dam. The Hetwane Dam was built to irrigate all the farms in this area. But after the SEZ land acquisition notices were sent out, the government stopped work on it. Now only some villages get water, ours don't. If we did, we could enjoy double cropping every year. Reliance wants to offer one job for each affected family, but double cropping will generate more work for us. Along with offering jobs to farmers, Reliance plans to compensate them for their land, but its valuation is often in dispute. Private parties always undervalued their property to save on the stamp duty. So if I'm a government, and I want to come to acquire land in a particular area. I have no way of knowing what is the market price of the land except through the registered documents. And that's one of the reasons why in spite of a 30% we give increase in price for compulsory acquisition, they still feel that they are not getting adequately uh, paid. But no matter how much money is paid to landowners, people like these fishermen will fall through the cracks they'll lose access to this river which they fished all their lives and receive no compensation for the loss of their livelihood. When the SEZ comes, it's the end of our business. We have always depended on fishing to make a living. The SEZ will destroy us. I don't know what I can do. Even if they give us jobs, I may lose my job anytime. Fishing is our traditional livelihood. It's reliable. Workers who depend on us would be affected too. In response, the government banned compulsory acquisition of land in April 2007. If a developer wants, he really needs to enter into you know, negotiations with the uh, farmers or anybody else for purchase of the land. So there's no compulsory acquisition. So com there's no compulsory acquisition for the last two years. But in Raigad, people we spoke to continue to receive land acquisition notices right up to July 2008. Until today, none of these notices have been retracted. The central government has given instructions, but state government is still firm on the acquisition process. So acquisition process is not taken back by the state government. There is a provision in the Land Acquisition Act. Once the notice was issued to the farmers, no transactions of land will be took place, take place. 
Three years ago, the government started issuing land acquisition notices to the people here in Raigad, effectively blocking the sale or lease of land to anyone else. Villagers who needed to do so in order to raise money for things like weddings and medical expenses could only sell to Reliance at a price set by the company. And that's what happened to Yeshwan Balaji Patil, a 52-year-old farmer. I had to go for a heart surgery and the medical expenses came up to 5,000 US dollars. I couldn't take a bank loan because I'd been served the land acquisition notice. So I had to sell my land even though I didn't want to. The company allowed me to keep working on the land until whenever they want to take over it. I'm illiterate, I don't know what will happen to me and I don't like this uncertainty. It's a different situation in the district of Pune, about two hours drive east of Raigad. Here, Indian MNC Bharat Forge, its largest exporter of auto components, has also bought up land for an SEZ. But farmers here are more satisfied with the process. Kailash Vishnu Torat sold two hectares of his barren land for about $60,000, which would have taken him up to three years to earn. There was initially a lot of agitation, but the company slowly convinced us. They assured people that they would only buy land that's barren. The canal was the boundary. They didn't touch the cultivable land on one side of it. We were afraid the land would be taken by force if we didn't agree to it. But they promised us jobs and 15% shares in the company. They gave a lot of assurances. They even started a technical institute to train people for the jobs. They paid for the training. It made it easier for us to trust them. Such trust is non-existent back in Raigad, where people continue to sing songs of resistance. Their fertile land is primed for farming. With the rainy season coming soon, the landscape is expected to turn green again. Even if we get some money, it may benefit us but not beyond this generation. The land is our security for future generations. This week, 101 East comes to you from Mumbai, where we are discussing the issue of India's special economic zones. And joining us now is Ulka Mahajan, convener of National Alliance of National People's Movement, and Professor Dana Manjiri Sate, head of economics faculty from Pune University. Thank you very much for joining us today. Dana Manjiri, if I can start with you. India's economic growth has been ongoing for the last decade or so. Are SEZs really necessary? Uh, yes, I would say that if we look at the uh, problem in the sense that we want to increase our rate of growth, which is about 6 to 9 percent or so, if we want to increase it to 15 percent, which is easily possible, then I think that SEZs would be playing a very important role in increasing the rate of growth of the economy. That being the case, though, the World Bank has come up with a report and the World Bank has said that the number of SEZs that have been approved are unsustainable, it's unfeasible, uh, they're not located strategically as well. It seems that there hasn't been much thought that's gone into setting up these SEZs. Is, is, is that right? There, I would agree with you. I think uh, one needs to take a more cautious approach with respect to setting up the SEZs in India. It is not something one should be doing it in a hap haphazard manner. I agree with you there. If that being the case, what should the government have kept in mind when setting up these SEZs? I think the important issues here would be uh, finding out the areas which are backward so that uh, they also start to grow at a higher rate of growth and to find out where the farmers are really interested in uh, having those SEZs there. So, Ulka, you're involved in the opposition towards SEZs. But there have been accusations that perhaps you are anti-development. Is that, is that the case? Are you anti-development or are you just against the loss of traditional livelihoods and lifestyles? Well, there are several issues involved. Nobody had opposed export promotion so far. There were export promotion zones from 1965 onwards in India, so it's not a new concept here. We have not, not, not opposed industrialization either. 
So it's not opposition to industrialization or export promotion or to development. But whoever takes sides of the most downtrodden sections uh, in this country is always labeled either as Naxalite or somebody who is anti-development. But here, uh, this country belongs to farmers. 70% of the uh, masses belong to agricultural communities and those whose livelihood is totally dependent on agriculture. If you're not thinking about those sections which is in majority and going ahead with special economic zones which are not at all committed uh, either to export promotion nor to employment generation nor to infrastructure development. The way they are going about it as uh, you already said that World Bank has objected to it, there are several other institutions, government institutions as well uh, who have objected to uh, the way SZs uh, are being brought here. Uh, parliamentary committee has given clear recommendations that we should not go ahead with the SZs the way we are going now. The, the government says that prime agricultural land takes up about 57% of India's mass land. Yeah. And the land that is being gazetted for SEZs is only 0.02%. So surely there's there's a lot of land See, that's this available. Is a, this is a this is a game of numbers. You know, if you say uh, when a SZ is taking place in a particular area, the area that is con, uh, that is diverted from agriculture to non-agriculture is much more, because there are many other uh, effects, implications of uh, the SZ and the uh, activities happening in the neighbourhood. So although uh, the land on record which is being diverted from agriculture to non-agriculture may seem as 0.002%, but the livelihood that would be lost by the people, amount of people, is huge. We're going to have to leave it there for just a while. We'll take a short break now, but when we come back, we'll hear from one man who's taking on the fight against India's SEZs. Stay tuned to 101 East.